So Civil War issue number five is a very exciting comic book in the Civil War series. And the reason for this is because up until this comic book, you know, throughout the, all the tie-ins that we've seen throughout Civil War Frontline and even the main comic book uh, com Civil War stories, We've really kind of seen this gradual build up. We've really kind of seen uh, seen this gradual increase, and we really kind of were given this indication that at the end of all this, there would be some major conflict that would take place. But it really kind of seemed to drag on. It really kind of seemed to be that Marvel was really providing us with more dialogue and more character development than actual action. I mean, we had seen action here and there. We especially saw action when we saw the whole conflict and uh, the destruction of uh, the Yancey Street area and the thing leaving the country and so on and so forth. But Civil War issue number five really kind of hits the ground running, where with previous Civil War issues, we really kind of slowly built into it. Civil War issue number five jumps off extremely fast. And what we see here is, if you recall Civil War issue number four, we had talked about how Susan Storm had left uh, Reed Richards. She had left his side, left Iron Man's side as part of the uh, pro-registration movement. And Johnny Storm was really kind of coming to, Johnny Storm was really kind of coming out of his coma, coming out of his injuries and really kind of healing. And so what we see is that Johnny Storm and Sue Storm are, of course, uh, side by side with one another, and they are on the side of Captain America, and they're attempting to escape S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, what we see is that as they're trying to get away, of course, Johnny Storm tells uh, Sue Storm to make them invisible, and S.H.I.E.L.D., of course, adapts to this power, adapts to her ability to make anybody invisible by using infrared. And this is really kind of important because by them using infrared, of course, they can track them no matter where they go. From here, we transition to Stark Tower. And again, if you recall Civil War issue number four, we had talked about how after the death of Goliath, there would be a kind of changing of the guard where people would leave both sides. Some people would leave Iron Man's side and go to Captain America's side, and some people would leave Captain America's side and go to Iron Man's side. And while we saw that Sue Storm had left the side of Iron Man and how Johnny Storm had left the side of Iron Man to join Captain America's side, we see that Nighthawk and Stature are leaving leaving Captain America's side to join Iron Man's side. Now, they're meeting with Happy Hogan here. And of course, Happy Hogan is the right-hand man of Tony Stark and has been for quite some time. But it's really kind of an interesting scenario here because under normal circumstances, they would be meeting with Tony Stark. And Happy Hogan really kind of takes note of this and says that Tony Stark should have been here by now, and it's a little strange that he hasn't been. And what we do is we really kind of transition to the upstairs portion of Stark Tower, and we see that Tony Stark and Peter Parker are fighting one another. And again, to tie back into Civil War issue number four, we had seen that, uh, and even with issue number three, that Peter Parker was really kind of developing these early feelings of questioning whether or not Tony Stark was right, whether or not superhuman registration was really the way to go. And where we had previously talked about Peter Parker really kind of developing these feelings and that it would evolve into something more, we really kind of see this coming to fruition. We see that Peter Parker, for the most part, is rebelling against Tony Stark, that he doesn't want to be part of this anymore, that he thinks that it's wrong, that he thinks that what's going on here is something that doesn't need to happen, because the idea of locking superheroes in the negative zone with no real trial, the idea of unleashing a, a clone of Thor, a cyborg, that resulted in the death of a fellow superhero, is pretty much something that, is, that really indicates this has gone far too uh, gone on far too long, and that uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. and Iron Man are simply just in over their heads. What we also see is a little bit of discussion here, a little bit of rationale on both sides of them. And, and Iron Man is really kind of interesting here because, again, we get a little more in-depth. We get a little more discussion here in terms of, uh, of what Iron Man's perspective is on this, that Iron Man believes that the problem is that if superheroes are not regulated, if superheroes are not registered, that this will lead to some kind of huge problem. It'll lead to some kind of huge crisis, and that ultimately it will lead to the government really kind of uh, regulating all superheroes. There will really not be any kind of a better system here. It won't simply be that some superheroes are registered if they choose to be, and those that don't will be arrested. It'll simply be that the government will ban all superheroes everywhere, and so this is really kind of the uh, the best scenario. Again, we really kind 
kind of see that uh, Peter Parker and Captain, or I'm sorry, that Iron Man begin to come to blows again. And Iron Man really kind of says, this is for the greater good. He says, it's not just about you. He says, what about uh, Aunt May? What about Mary Jane? And uh, and Peter Parker says that, uh, that they're as far away as possible. They are as safe as he can possibly make them. And then this is really kind of when Tony Stark realizes that there's no coming back for Peter Parker, that Peter Parker is in no way going to really kind of change his mind, that he is now irrevocably against the superhuman registration movement. And you know, Iron Man goes as far as to say that he's disappointed in this. And Peter Parker, of course, responds by saying that he's not nearly as disappointed in, uh, I'm sorry, that Tony Stark is not nearly as disappointed in Peter Parker as Peter Parker is in himself. From here, we see Peter Parker try to escape, but of course, the glass is reinforced. And then we see S.H.I.E.L.D. arrive. Now, initially, uh, Iron Man really kind of tries to stop S.H.I.E.L.D. from shooting at Peter Parker, not necessarily because he doesn't want to see Spider-Man killed, but because if the glass is destroyed, then Peter Parker will be able to escape. And of course, as a result of uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. coming in and firing at Peter Parker, they destroy the glass and Peter Parker is able to get away. We see that uh, as a response to this, because Peter Parker's Spider-Man is now able to escape and he's now, now kind of out on his own, that Maria Hill activates the new uh, Thunderbolts protocol. And if we recall again, our discussion about the previous Civil War events, we had talked about how how the Baron Zemo-led group of uh, the Thunderbolts had really kind of gone away, but some of those members stayed along, and when they stayed, they became part of the new Thunderbolts arrangement that was set up by uh, by S.H.I.E.L.D. So, of course, we see individuals like Taskmaster, uh, Taskmaster. we see Lady Deathstrike, we see uh, Venom, we see various individuals who had previously been supervillains now fighting on behalf of the federal government, and this is something that will become very, very important, especially when we get into Civil War issue number six. And what we see is that, of course, Spider-Man is underground now. Spider-Man is actually literally underground and is really kind of trying to figure out what to do next, trying to figure out what his next move is. And then we see that he's confronted by a couple supervillains who are members of the Thunderbolts, who, of course, are now released and are tasked with the goal of finding uh, uh, Spider-Man. We see that he's confronted by Jack-O-Lantern and by Jester. Now, these villains weren't necessarily major villains in the realm of Marvel Comics as a whole. These were really kind of villains that were confined to Spider-Man comics, but they were very formidable villains nonetheless. Jack-O-Lantern was, in a lot of ways, kind of a spinoff of the Green Goblin. And Jester was really kind of a spinoff of, uh, I guess, maybe a combination of the Joker from DC Comics and the Green Lantern, I'm sorry, the uh, Green Goblin from Marvel Comics. Uh, we see that, uh, for the most part, Peter Parker is really kind of caught unawares. And because of the fact that both of these villains are formidable in their own right, there really isn't a whole lot that Peter Parker can do against the both of them. Uh, their intention, after they pretty much have kind of defeated him, is to kill him. But of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. tells him, tells these individuals to stand down. Of course, they re they report that they have Peter Parker captured, and while S.H.I.E.L.D. is on their way to, uh, I guess, to attain or to uh, take Peter Parker into custody, we see that Jack-O-Lantern is killed. In addition, we don't really know who it was that did this. We simply know that someone is standing there and that someone has effectively uh, rendered both the Jester and Jack-O-Lantern uh, dead, more or less, that they've basically killed them. Uh, but what we see is that uh, Peter Parker really kind of responds to this and says that I know your face, you're that skull face guy. And this is really kind of an indication to us that this is Frank Castle, the Punisher. Now from here, we again switch back to uh, Susan Storm and Johnny Storm, and we see that they have new disguises. And again, they kind of poke fun at the idea that Nick Fury had given them these kind of disguises that were a little strange in the sense that they're actually together now, that they are uh, masquerading as husband and wife, which is a little strange considering that they're brother and sister. But the the idea of Nick Fury in uh, the Civil War event is really kind of intriguing here, and I think it's important that we touch on this. The Civil, uh, the Civil War event is, of course, one of the major events in Marvel Comics. And we don't see Nick Fury here. We see Nick Fury hinted at, we see Nick Fury discussed, but we don't actually really see Nick Fury proper in the sense that we see him talking to everybody else in person. And the reason for this is because there is a much larger and far more I guess maybe 
catastrophic event that's coming up in Marvel Comics after the Civil War that Nick Fury is really kind of uncovered, that he's really found the uh, beginnings of. And so Nick Fury is really kind of off dealing with this while simultaneously doing the best he can to aid those individuals who are underground that are on Captain America's side. From here, of course, we see that uh, Susan Storm and Johnny Storm arrive at Captain America's hideout at uh, in Queens, I believe, and we really kind of get a little more detail on some of the characters that we haven't seen just yet. Of course, we see them talking about Cloak and Dagger and about how they had been captured. And we see that uh, Captain America is a little frustrated here because they're essentially losing one man for every person that they gain. And so they're really not making any ground in terms of being able to match the numbers that are on the side of Tony Stark. Now, this next section is extremely important because what we see is that Hulkling, who is a shapeshifter and a member of the Young Avengers, offers to uh, improve impersonate a staff of the Baxter building and to gain the, uh, I guess maybe the security blueprints for um, the, the Baxter building itself. But we see that Captain America declines this offer and tells him that he has a much bigger job for him in Arizona. In addition, we see that he gives the task of, uh, of going to, I guess, another, another goal of some sort to the Invisible Woman. Now, we will see what the, uh, the tasks are that Captain America gives to these individuals, but we won't learn about them them until Civil War issue number six. And so I would like you to pay very close attention or really kind of keep this in the back of your heads because these two things will become very important. In addition, we see that as they're conversing, as they're talking, the Punisher enters holding Peter Parker. And he really kind of tells Captain America or somebody in general that they need to get a medic so they can tend to Peter Parker. And what we kind of see here is that uh, Captain America calls for Jane Foster to assist Peter Parker and to really kind of tend to his his medical injuries, to really kind of tend to the, the injuries that he sustained as a result of fighting both Jester and Jack-O-Lantern. In addition, we really kind of see the group discussing what to do with Frank Castle. They're really not sure what side he's on. Maybe he's on the side of Captain America. Maybe he's on the side of Iron Man. And Falcon goes as far as to ask the question, you know, which side are you on here? In addition, we see that uh, Frank Castle chose the side of Captain America because Iron Man has allied himself with supervillains. And this is not something that we've seen Captain America do yet. Iron Man really chose to uh, ally himself only in so far that he would use the Thunderbolts as a means to an end. But Captain America has not chosen this road. Now, whether or not this is a road that Captain America chose because he simply didn't want to have anything to do with villains or because he just simply didn't have access to him is not necessarily necessarily something that we've been given yet, and I don't think that he actually goes into detail about this. In addition, they're really kind of debating as to whether or not they should allow Frank Castle to stay a part of their group. And what we learn here is that if you recall in Civil War issue number four, we had talked about how when Nighthawk and others were leaving uh, Captain America's team, that there was a masked individual that was watching over everything. Now, the initial indication, and I think that Marvel had kind of played on this, was that this individual may have been Crossbones. We didn't really know who he was. But then we learned that it was actually Frank Castle. And that Frank Castle had, in the background and in the shadows, kept multiple individuals off the scent of Captain America's team. And it really kind of uh, bailed them out of scenarios where they normally would have been captured, albeit doing it with kind of a hidden hand. And so people are really kind of hesitant about Frank Castle. They're really kind of unsure about Frank Castle. Because Frank Castle is an enigma in Marvel Comics. We know about him, but we don't really know what it is that he'll do. He is kind of like Deadpool in a lot of ways. Frank Castle has a moral code, and Frank Castle's code says that he kills villains everywhere, no matter what they're doing. But we don't necessarily know whether or not he's in a stable uh, state of mind. We don't know if he is sane at this point in time, because a large portion of the superhero community considers him to be insane. Now, Luke Cage, of course, asks him, do we want to keep Frank Castle here? And Captain America simply says that he's thinking. But what we also see is that while all these individuals are meeting, someone is kind of hidden in a corner and is recording the entire event. Now, from here, we see that Daredevil has been captured in Hell's Kitchen, and he's being taken away by S.H.I.E.L.D., but he's also kind of being escorted by uh, by Reed Richards. But before the, uh, I guess, the transportation vehicle leaves for presumably the negative zone, we really kind of see Reed Richards talking with She-Hulk. And this is really kind of interesting here, because for the most part, we've never really seen an instance so far where Reed Richards is really kind of questioning this whole superhuman registration thing. And, and he's really not questioning this so far 
far in the sense that he regrets getting involved, he's really just kind of questioning the motives and really kind of questioning the end result here. Of course, Reed Richards has used mathematical probability to determine the fact that this is the most rational course of action. But again, it really doesn't uh, doesn't assuage his guilty conscience because for the most part, there really isn't anyone in his family on his corner in his corner anymore. Susan Storm, Johnny Storm, they've left for the side of Captain America. Uh, the Thing has left for Paris. He's not in the United States anymore. And so all that Reed Richards really has is Valeria Richards and Franklin Richards and their kids. They really don't understand the stake, the uh, the ramifications of what's going on at this point in time. And we see him really kind of, uh, I guess, discussing with uh, She-Hulk his thoughts. He's really kind of talking to her about how things are going. He's really kind of saying he's not really sure about what's going on here. But she really kind of assuages this and says that they've given them a future. They've given them the chance to continue their role as superheroes rather than allowing this kind of fear on behalf of society and the perception of superheroes bubble up to a point where it just kind of leads to this place where all superheroes are outlawed entirely. 